All right, let's go here. Yeah. Okay, everyone, welcome. This is uh, Guerrilla Physics. This is the night before your, probably your last exam and congratulations on getting that. Um, I hope you're all doing all right. Um, sorry for being a few minutes late. Yeah, quarter of an hour late, sorry about that, but some of you were tuning into the AQA one anyway. This is specifically for OCR Gateway, but um, loads of things will be relevant to all exam boards and probably between the AQA one and the OCR one, we've covered everything for Excel as well. Um, just remember today, I'm just gonna go through some kind of set explains. So don't worry too much about really your deep understanding or anything. Just think about if you recognize this is the area of the syllabus, then just apply that explain explain that I've given you. Okay, so just bang that down. Um, if you ask at the end, I will tell you a story about the Tunisian cows, uh, which is, well, I don't wanna to give too much away with that. And I will, um, <laughs> I'm not gonna say your name there. And I'll also look at the chat um, just at the end for you guys as well. If you've got any questions, I probably will cover a lot of those points in the stream anyway. But if you've got any questions, then I'll stick around for a 10 minutes or so at the end to do a Q&A with you. Um, also in the description, then there are some suggested videos as usual. There are some, I think some really good ones. Um, there is yesterday's six marker stream. So the secret to six marks. There was um, last year's paper two stuff and loads of paper two questions probably haven't got time this evening to go through all of those but uh, I think that going through some of them and thinking oh that 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 their, their questions I normally get stuck on is well worth you doing um, and also there's a good stream in there the hardest bits in GCSE which I think is really really good okay my name's Kit as well by the way not Mr Gorilla Physics but I guess you can call me Sir Gorilla if you like um, okay so we're going to go into the power As I said, don't panic about any of these. Just think these are explanations that I can apply in my test, okay, in my exam. All right, so this is the wave speed equation and uh, this is um, the most important equation for waves. Basically, wave speed is frequency times wavelength, F times lambda. Wave speed is a constant in any given medium, so it's always the same, basically, in whatever the wave is traveling through. The speed of light in a vacuum, for example, is always three times 10 to the eight meters per second. The speed of sound in air is always 343 meters per second. Therefore, frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional proportional to each other. So that's what this graph shows. Double one thing, half the other thing, okay? And that's because it is uh, constant wave speed in that medium. These are the wave quantities, okay? And they're represented on two graphs. Now, whenever you get any graphs in physics, always make sure you look first thing at the, um, always make sure you look first thing at the labels on the axes to check what you're actually looking at. So the first graph here, this um, from peak to peak is the time period because that's a displacement versus time graph. This still shows the amplitude because the amplitude is the height of the wave from the equilibrium position. But uh, this graph down here would show the wavelength from peak to peak because it's a displacement versus displacement graph. This still shows the amplitude though, which is from the equilibrium position to the peak. The last quantity is the frequency. Frequency is the number of full waves every second. And frequency is inverse the time period. So frequency is one over the time period or time period is one over the frequency. I'm trying not to be distracted by the chat. Okay, it's funny, but you know, let's move on. Um, measure wavelength using, um, sorry, measure wavelength using a stroboscope, which is a flashing light. So you can kind of pause the wave in space by flashing a light at the same frequency as it. And you just use a ruler to measure the wavelength. Make sure whenever you're describing a practical, you always say exactly what you're measuring and what you're measuring it with. Measure the frequency by counting the number of waves in 10 seconds using a stopwatch, dividing by 10. And that gives you greater accuracy because you've increased the size of what you're measuring and you've got that, you've got that, um, a human reaction time that can mean that you're less accurate for smaller times. Frequency multiplied by wavelength should be a constant and that's like the result of this practical and that's important. I've put down there once again, wave speed is frequency times wavelength is the wave speed equation. Okay, sound is an example of a longitudinal wave. Uh, longitudinal waves have high pressures and low pressure regions. Um, they have oscillations, okay, which are parallel to the direction of energy transfer. So if the wave is traveling along, then the oscillation is also along. It's in the same direction as the wave is traveling. Um, human uh, range of hearing is between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. And this sound can be used for echolocation, which is, could be, for example, ultrasound scanners above 20,000 hertz, sonar, 
uh, finding ships in the sea basically and by bats and dolphins and remember you you'd be given a time for a pulse to return so that's there and back and then you've got the speed of the wave you can calculate distance from distances speed times time but don't forget to half the time that you're using divide the time by two because the time is to get there and back now light is an example of a transverse wave transverse wave transverse waves have oscillations which are perpendicular to the direction of wave energy transfer so you can do that on a diagram if you like see the oscillation is up and down when the energy transfer is along and transverse waves have peaks and troughs light is a continuous spectrum of electromagnetic radiation okay increasing frequency and increasing energy towards the ionizing portion so radio waves microwaves infrared red orange yellow green blue indigo violet visible light that is then uv x-rays and gamma and those are the ionizing ones okay the highest frequency therefore the highest energy portions higher frequency lower wavelength and all remember have the same speed three times 10 to the eight uh, meters per second in a vacuum okay th this is the quantum bit this is where light really comes from so just think about this as a nice simple explanation electrons exist in what we call energy levels in physics in atoms it's a bit like shells but it's not quite the same as shells in chemistry so we say energy levels in atoms so electrons have certain amounts of energies uh, as they are in the in the um, atom now when light is absorbed when atoms absorb light electrons are gaining energy so they're going up the energy levels so this is a low frequency photon therefore it's like a redder photon it's a low energy photon so it's raising the electron up the electron gains the same energy as the photon now this one is a, a atom emitting light and photons are released because the electrons fall down the energy levels so there is an energy level change which means energy is emitted and that gives you a higher frequency therefore higher energy light Remember this, more energy, higher frequency. So just think about that. Just remember electrons in certain energy levels, the energy level increases or decreases and it absorbs or emits the light, therefore. That's how come uh, everything gives out light. That's how come everything absorbs light. It's because of that quantum stuff. Okay, so it's a really important bit. This is about optics and optics is about how we see, but it's about basically how we can refract light to make images. So. This eye at the top here is a short-sighted eye, which is um, incoming light from a distant object. It's being refracted by the lens, but it's focusing too short of the retina. And that means that short-sighted people can't see things really, really far away, not going to get an unfocused image. Long sight is when you can't see things really close to you. And this is because the light is um, not refracted enough by the lens, in other words, and it's focused long of the retina. So the focal point of this will be behind the retina. Therefore, long sighted people can't see things really close to them. Now, why do waves refract anyway? Because their speed changes as they move from one medium to another. Lenses are basically an application of this, which allows us to change the focus of light. That's what optics is. Short sighted eyes have raised focus in short of the retina, and they're corrected by concave lenses, so diverging lenses. Long sighted eyes have raised focus in behind the retina, and they're convected by convex lenses. This is a practical, which is important in the triple um, science, and I've labeled up the triple and the higher stuff as you go through. Okay, so um, what you must do whenever you do a practical into, uh, if, if, if it's reflection or if it's refraction, you must make sure you construct a normal line, which is a line at 90 degrees to the boundary. Okay, the angle of incidence is between the incident ray and the normal, and the angle of refraction is between the refracted ray and the normal. And we always measure angles between a ray and the normal. And that's one of the things we'll be looking at in describing this practical. Are the students telling us to measure the rays, measure the angles between rays and a normal line? We we'll measure an angle with a protractor. We measure the angle of incidence with a protractor, the angle of refraction with a protractor. When light goes from air to glass, then the angle of refraction will be smaller than the angle of incidence. When light goes from glass to air, the angle of refraction will be larger than the angle of incidence, or it refracts away from the normal, you could say. That's just an accurate. Um, now these are ray diagrams. So ray diagrams are really easy if you just follow this simple one, two, three, four step method. You'll be given a ray diagram without the rays that are labeled one, two, three, and four. So number one here is um, the first ray that you would draw, and you do that for both, no matter if it's a converging or a diverging lens. You draw a ray from the top of the object, parallel to the axis, to the middle of the lens. Okay, then number two, you refract that ray through the principal focus. 
Now in the case of the converging lens, you use the far principal focus, this one. So you refract the rays through and where they cross is where the image or the top of the image is formed. Then you always do this ray as well, no matter if it's converging or diverging. Number three, you always take a ray from the top of the object through the very optical center of the lens. And where they cross, that's where the top of the image is formed. Okay, so the base of the image is always on the axis though. Now with the diverging lens, it's ever so slightly different. Still the first, um, still one and three, exactly the same. Ray parallel to the axis, to the middle of the lens, refract that ray, but this is diverging now, so it's refracting the ray out. Um, so you, and you line up that ray with the principal focus on the left-hand side of the, of the lens, the, the object side of the lens. That just tells you where that ray is going. It tells you what direction that ray is going. It's still, however, where those rays cross that the image is made. Now, let's talk about describing the images. The image here is uh, uh, inverted, it's upside down. It is diminished, it's smaller than the object, and it is real. Now, that means if I put a screen there, then I would get that image on the screen. This image, however, though, is upright, it's diminished still, and it's virtual. It means if I put a screen there, I wouldn't get that image on the screen because there's no light actually hitting that point there. Okay, the light is going through and it's coming. We're seeing the light over from this far side of the lens. And I hope that, that helps. Just go one, two, three, four, and you'll get four marks from that. Radioactivity now. So decay equations are really straightforward as long as you remember your alpha and your beta um, actual like, symbols. Um, radioactivity, remember, is random. It's just when a nucleus, which is an unstable thing, decays to become more stable. I'll just say I'll get, I'll get uh, questions at the end if that's all right. Uh, decays in radioactivity, randomly nuclei decay to become more stable. So you need to think about that. Some are less stable than others. Now a decay equation, you just need to think, is it alpha or beta? You stick on the uh, numbers for alpha and beta and you make the top line and the bottom line balance. So beta is an electron, so it's minus one charge, zero mass. So let's make the top line balance. 14 is something plus zero is 14. And bottom line six is seven minus one. Make top line and bottom line balance. These are really easy, again, if you know the, the trick to them. And then alpha is four and two, it's a helium nucleus, it's two protons and two neutrons, so a mass of four. 240 is something plus four, well, that's gotta be 236. 94 is 92 plus two. Just make the, the top line balance and then the bottom line balance. So I've said a lot of these things well, what alpha and beta are. Remember, um, alpha is the most um, ionizing because it's got two plus charge. It's got two protons and no electrons. It's very ionizing. And because it is a highly ionizing, it's got the lowest penetration, only two to four centimeters in air, and it's absorbed by really thin paper. A beta particle is a high speed electron. It's a medium ionization because it is a charged particle. It's got minus one charge. Again, it's got medium ionization, so medium penetration, if you like, about two meters in air, and it's absorbed by two millimeters of aluminum. And lastly, gamma, which has no charge at all, that's why it was zero, zero, no charge, no mass, uh, is a photon of high frequency electromagnetic radiation, and its ionization is very low, and because of that, it has the highest penetration, it should say, sorry, highest penetration, absorbed by thick lead or by concrete. Now, half-life is very easy, is the average time taken for the number of nuclei or for the activity to half. Now, a lot of people get confused with this and they say, oh, all right, if they take this graph, they would say the half-life is 125 because you start with 250. No, that's the half the number. You have to find the time. Okay, so find the time from a graph is just as simple as half the number and then read off the time by interpolation. Okay, half the activity and then interpolate. You should probably do at least two. So here I've done a second one. Two half-lives have taken 153 seconds. So one half-life is 77.5 and this is real data from protactinium incidentally that's why it has an uncertainty there now um, you do need to talk about dangers and uses in terms of the half-life of isotopes and the type of radiation they emit so there's two risks okay which are contamination and that's when an object becomes a source because basically the material has got onto it 
and irradiation, which is when you take away the source, the object is no longer radioactive. It's just been exposed to alpha, beta, or gamma. Irradiation is probably less risky than contamination. We're much more worried about radioactive material getting out than the occasional alpha, beta, or gamma hitting something. Fission is very straightforward as well. Fission is large nuclei splitting to join to sorry splitting to form smaller ones. Mass is converted into energy by E equals mc squared. So basically, a little bit of mass goes missing in this reaction. I've done a reaction over there, um, and that's turned into energy. Two or three neutrons are given out at each fission. You see these little green neutrons flying out from the fissile nucleus. These neutrons go and they they cause more fissions. So these neutrons are going to be absorbed by other um, fissionable uraniums and they're going to split and give out more neutrons as well. So that's why we get this chain reaction because each time you get one fission, you get more neutrons that cause more fissions. Um, and we can control this though, luckily, by just having a control rod which is going to absorb those neutrons. The problem with this, one of the big problems with it, is it has radioactive products. Okay, so the, 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 the krypton and the barium themselves here are actually radioactive themselves. So that means that we have radioactive waste to deal with, and that's a big issue. Fusion, however, gives you no radioactive waste. So fusion is when you're taking hydrogen. So these are two isotopes of hydrogen. Hi isotopes have same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Tritium, which has a mass of three, and deuterium, which has a mass of two. And they're coming together to fuse to make helium. And because we've got an extra neutron around, that's gonna go off at high speeds and have a lot of kinetic energy. So what fusion is, is small nuclei joining to become larger ones. So fusing, coming together, joining to make larger nuclei. It needs high temperatures and high pressures to give nuclei enough kinetic energy to bring them close enough to fuse. Because they're both positive, right? So they are gonna repel. So they need to be coming together at really high energies to get over that potential field to get close enough to fuse to cause um, them to turn into helium and fuse and give it the energy. Again though, mass is converted to energy by the same equation, uh, E equals mc squared. Now, the good thing about fusion is it stops once the fuel runs out. So if we wanna do a certain amount of fusion, we just have to supply a certain amount of fuel. And the only product is helium, which is not a hazard. Okay, moving on. Um, efficiency then, now we're onto the energy and efficiency part of um, uh, OCR gateway. Efficiency is defined as a ratio of useful output energy to total input energy. So it's just useful over total basically. You can do power or energy in fact. And it can be expressed as either a percentage or as a decimal. So if you times this by 100 you get a percentage. Moving on then. Remember there are eight stores and only four transfers. Okay, so they memorize these. Make sure you get these answers, these words into your answers. The chemical store, the thermal store, the kinetic, the gravitational, the elastic, the nuclear, the electrostatic, and the magnetic stores. Uh, and then there are four transfers, four ways which energy can get from one store to another. Mechanical work, electrical work, heating by particles, and by radiation. Now, just say these things. Just If you're asked about to use ideas about energy stores and transfers or ideas about energy, just talk about one store emptying and another store filling. That's all we need to be saying here. Okay, um, let's t take the pen dropping or something. Gravitational store empties, kinetic store fills, and it's mechanically transferred by forces. Okay, that's all we need to be saying. Uh, energy going from one store to another, so one store, starting store decreasing, other store increasing, and then the transfer. And say what the store is, so it's the gravitational store of the pen, okay, transferred to the kinetic store of the pen. Um, an energy analysis is, a, is an application of the law of conservation of energy, that we can't get something for nothing. We can't get, um, we can't create or destroy energy, just transfer between stores. We can just transfer energy between stores. Um, therefore, what we can do though, is we can calculate that gravitational store, the value of that, and we can say all that gravitational store, all that gravitational energy is going to fill the kinetic store, and therefore that's going to be, um, we can work out the speed therefore if we knew its mass. Okay, so it's about working out one thing, calculating one thing, calculating another thing. In fact, we wouldn't even need to work out its mass because the mass would cancel in that one, which could be a really hard calculation question they could give you. So this is a practical into energy transfers, which is when you heat up a block, you use energy analysis, basically you supply the block with electrical energy using electrical heater, and you do electrical energy is um, 
potential difference times current times time, which is this equation. I just memorized that myself. Um, you measure the potential difference with the voltmeter in parallel across a heater. You measure the current with a uh, ammeter in series with the heater. Okay, say all those things, how to do, uh, what to use, what to measure, and how to do it accurately. You measure the time with a stopwatch. You calculate, therefore, the energy supplied to the material. You say this is equal to the thermal energy. Okay, the change in thermal energy, which is mc delta t, which is mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change. And now you can work out, well, you can work out the specific heat capacity probably is going to be the aim of this practical. You measure the mass with a top pan balance, and you measure the temperature change with the thermometer by measuring the start and the final um, uh, temperature. You work out the difference between the, the starting temperature and the final temperature. So here's an equation you do need to memorize for energy though, which is kinetic energy half mv squared. This kinetic energy is something which is stored in something because it's moving. If you double the speed, you quadruple the energy because of that v squared. And that will come back when we talk about breaking distances and things. So I've done a simple calculation down here, mass being a quarter of a kilogram, speed being four. Uh, just plug those numbers in, make sure you show us that you are inputting the numbers in the right place. A half times 0 0.25 times four squared. The kinetic energy is two joules. And I would just remember the rearranged form in case you do need to work from kinetic energy to speed and you're given the mass. That's the rearranged form. V equals root two kinetic energies over mass. You also need to, re you don't need to remember this one. You get given this one, okay? This is the energy transferred in stretching something, a half times K times delta X squared. So a half times the spring constant times the extension squared. This is gravitational potential energy. It's energy stored in something because it's high up in a gravitational field. It's mass times gravitational field strength times height. You do need to memorize that one. Now evaluating energy resources are really important. Always think about evaluating them in the specific context of the question. It's not going to be simple like tell us the advantages of a coal power station or something like that. It's going to be like why is the coal power station more appropriate in this situation than a nuclear power station, for example. Okay, so make comparative statements, you know, talk about one type of power station might produce more energy per kilogram of fuel than another type. You know, so don't just say, oh, there are lots of energy made, no marks for that. More energy per kilogram than another type is a useful thing to say, though. So talk about comparisons. Give detailed descriptions of environmental considerations. So, for example, fossil fuels release, power, um, release CO2 into the atmosphere, which contributes to global warming, whereas nuclear power stations do not. There's a detailed comparison in there, isn't there? Consider how long and how abundant the energy resource is. So this is about non-renewables. Fossil fuels are non-renewable. Nuclear is non-renewable. And they will not be replaced at the rate we are using them. This, it's important. It's not just that... Um, they, we don't get them back, okay, it's not, well, they'll not be replaced at the rate we are using them. Whereas renewable resources like wind, solar and hydro are renewable, so they come back as quickly as we can use them. Consider the changing demand of the energy in your answers. Okay, the demand is greater now in the 21st century than it was because of lots of reasons. Increasing population, abundance of devices. Look at all the devices I'm using right now. Loads of energy being transferred, um, which consume energy. And the demand is greater in the daytime than in the night because there are more people using devices than in the day. Okay, moving up, moving on, dudes. Right, so now we're talking about the equation of uniform motion. We're on to the kind of global challenges bit now. We're on to the bit about um, road safety and things like that. Can um, There can be applied situations, the equation of uniform motion, where the acceleration is uniform. It's a constant. This equation is v squared equals u squared plus 2as. You don't need to memorize it. You get given it, but you should really know of it. Final velocity squared is initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times distance. They often write it as v squared minus u squared equals 2as, which is just a rearranged form. For example, then, a car accelerates uniformly. So if you see accelerates uniformly, then you're going to think to yourself, this is definitely um, where I'm going to put in. I'm definitely going to use the equation of uniform motion. <laughs> yeah, okay, they're giving you a clue, aren't they? Um, five meters per second squared. It travels 20 meters. Calculates final velocity. So we're, we're told it starts from zero. It starts from rest. The acceleration is five meters per second squared. The distance is 20 meters. Input the numbers, because you'll get a mark for putting numbers in the equations in the right place, everyone. Work out what V squared is, then root it to get V. Okay, next bit. Um, stopping distance is just coming, um, dude. 
Road safety, okay, stopping distance. Stopping distance is thinking distance plus breaking distance, okay? So um, thinking distance and breaking distance, remember is what we're talking about there. Add them together and that gives you stopping distance. So thinking distance is the distance the car travels whilst you are reacting to the hazard. And I keep saying distance because a lot of people confuse it with thinking time. Braking distance is the distance the car travels once the brakes are applied, and that adds up to the stopping distance, right? So factors that affect thinking distance are factors which affect thinking time or reaction time, okay? So keep those two ideas slightly separate because time and distance are not the same thing. Just double check yourself when you're writing answers about this because you won't get it right if the answer wants thinking distance and you write thinking time or vice versa. Now, factors that affect reaction time are alcohol or drugs, they're the same factor. Think, uh, sorry, distractions in the car. That's a big deal for young people in cars. And tiredness, okay. So they affect a human. Factors that affect the braking distance are things to do with the car or the road. They're mechanical things. So icy or wet roads. Don't just say weather, by the way. Say icy or wet roads. Worn tires. Don't just say condition of the tires. They're worn out. Worn brakes, okay. So Tell us what we want to hear. So if you double the speed, then you do double the thinking distance. And that's because twice the speed, twice the distance if they've got the same time. Distance is speed times time. Um, double the speed though, you quadruple the braking distance. And that's because you're dissipating energy. It's because of the V squared in the kinetic energy equation. So you do need to know how to estimate typical speeds and um, accelerations and forces. So if you think about, you know a lot of typical speeds in like miles per hour, you know like on a built up road it's 30 miles per hour. So if you divide that by 2.2, then you get the speed in meters per second. So you do need to be aware of that. Roughly divide by two gives you meters per second. And then you do need to know some typical masses if you're gonna uh, estimate some typical forces. So that's like a normal car about a thousand kilograms, okay? A big car, 2000 kilograms, a small car about a thousand kilograms, a ton. Um, and a typical deceleration, if you're just gradually coming to a stop at, let's say, traffic lights, would be like minus two meters per second, something around that. And a typical deceleration, if you had a crash, would be like minus 20 meters per second. Now, crumple zones are designed to reduce that, that deceleration to mean that you reduce the force. And the way they do that, crumple zones and seat belts and crash helmets, anything that works by kind of absorbing the impact energy, uh, actually is all about increasing the collision time. So the crumple zone means that the car comes to less of a immediate stop. So no crumple zone, crumple zone. A longer time, increase the collision time, reduce the acceleration, so reduce the force, so there is less um, likelihood of injury. Next thing then, mains electricity, just remember these, okay. Um, the brown wire is the live wire. Now that alternates between, it's actually plus 225, but anyway, it alternates between a positive and a negative voltage. It's AC voltage on that, and it does it 50 times per second. So remember, it's AC, 230 volts, 50 hertz. Blue wire is the neutral wire. That's a zero volts. So whenever the, it's connected to uh, a complete circuit with the brown wire, with the live, you get a potential difference between those two of 230 volts. The earth wire is the green and, and yellow one. It's a low resistance path. It's a safety feature. And you need to know how the fuse and the earth wire act to keep us safe. If there's a surge of current, then the fuse will melt. Therefore, the circuit is broken. Therefore, large current flows through the low resistance wire to earth rather than through the user. Now, um, why am I saying all these things? Okay, they just you need to think to yourself, okay, I recognize it's the fuse action. One, two, three, those three little statements and boom, you will get the marks for that question, okay? You don't need to overthink it, but you do need to say these things. High current causes a fuse to melt or to blow or to break, circuit breaks, therefore the large current flows through the low resistance wire down to earth. Power is the rate of energy transfer, sorry, what? A what? What? As a joule per second, oh. So a joule per second is a what, okay? I'm gonna ask you in the um, comments now, what is the unit of power? Okay, so electrical power is the product of um, current and potential difference. So electrical power is IV, P equals IV. Larger current, larger voltage, larger power. And we can use that to work out how transformers in the national grid actually can save us energy. So this is the transformer power equation. So this is the, uh, 
primary power, V times I on the primary. This is the secondary power, V times I on the secondary. So potential difference times current on either side. Now we use step up transformers on the way into the national grid to step up the voltage. If you step up the voltage, you step down the current. Now the current is reduced. Increase the PD, in fact, if you double the PD, you half the current. So we reduce the current in the transmission wires, and here's the important bit to get in, because that reduces the heat loss. So I want you to remember that idea. Current causes heating. There's loads of answers that are about that. Current causes heating. And if you remember power loss equals I squared R, then that is the equation that's going to help you to remember that double the current, quadruple the power loss. But half the current, then you get a quarter of the power loss. And we actually reduce the, uh, the current by a factor of like 100 or something like that. So you get like 10,000 times less the power loss. Now, that makes the whole um, system more efficient, right? The whole system is more efficient, therefore, because you get less power loss, less energy wasted. Uh, now we use step down transformers to reduce the potential difference so it's safe for users in the home or in a business. Okay, now the, the, a question about this where well, you could be asked to explain like that or you could be asked to calculate with this and you basically be given the potential difference on the primary and the current on the primary or something, you'd be um, one of the other two and you have to work out the other, work out the fourth one. So you'd be given three of these and asked to work out the fourth. Now as I said, remember this has power loss, P is I squared R. Current causes heating, and as electrons, what's actually going on in current causing heating? The electrons are colliding with the metal atoms, and you get more frequent collisions that makes the atoms, the ions, vibrate more. So temperature increases, and therefore resistance increases, and you get more frequent collisions. It's another way of calculating electrical power as well. If you don't have current, and um, so if you have current resistance rather than current and voltage. Energy, remember, is power times time, or you could redefine that as power as the uh, rate of energy transfer, as we've done before. But this is a useful equation for calculating energy transferred. And we use the kilowatt hour as an alternative unit when we're calculating large values for energy, for example, in domestic or commercial billing, so home or like office billing, basically. So if we work out the same, um, I think this is the same, yeah, it's the same number, or the same um, energy transferred in joules first and then in kilowatt hours, you'll see how they're slightly different. So 200 watts times 18,000 seconds, which is half an hour, so 1,800 seconds. Energy is power times time, sub the numbers in, show the examiner you can do that. 360,000 joules, big number of joules, right? But if we're using that same um, 200 watt thing, appliance, then we can talk about it as being 0.2 kilowatts, multiply that by half an hour, 0.5 hours, and now we've got 0.2 times 0.5, and we're just down at 0.1 kilowatt hours. So there'll be times when that's very, very useful when we're talking about really large values for energy. We wouldn't want to see millions of joules on our bills that would be harder figures for um, normal people to work with. So we're on to the space bit now. It's one of my favorite bits, okay, which is, um, this one is all about the Big Bang Theory. Okay, the Big Bang Theory just states that the universe expanded from a single point, and um, Edwin Hubble was the chap that started this ball rolling, really, okay. He measured um, the speed that galaxies are moving away from us, and, um, sorry, he measured that using the amount the light is red shifted. So this, these two diagrams here are the red shift diagrams. Now, if we have something stat, sat still, a stationary source, then we maybe get these wavelengths emitted from it. But if we see something which is moving away from us at high speed, then it is going to, uh, the light is going to be red shifted. It's going to be shifted towards the higher wavelength end because as it moves away, it gets further and further away from each subsequent wave that it emitted. So the light becomes higher wavelength. So we just say that, okay, the light has become a higher wavelength. It's been shifted towards the red end because the thing is moving away from us. Now, he, what he did was plotted the speed against the distance, and he noticed that more distant galaxies are moving faster, and actually they're proportional. The faster they're going away, the bigger the distance is. So the further away they are, the bigger the speed they are going away from us, and double the distance, double the speed. And that's evidence, that is Hubble's law, and that's evidence that the universe is expanding. Now, the final bit of evidence for the Big Bang Theory was the CMBR, the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. And it comes from everywhere in the universe, meaning that every part of the universe did start as the same point because it all has the same signal, okay? It's often referred to as the smoking gun. The, everything has the same signal, therefore, it all came from the same point. 
And this is evidence for the universe starting from that single point. It's the confirmation of the Big Bang Theory. So now um, stellar evolution, but really quick bit on stuff in the solar system. So from smallest to largest, comets, dwarf planets, moons, planets, and then the sun. Okay, you just need to be aware of those things, really, um, objects in our solar system. Now, stellar evolution is the life cycle of a star and um, the <laughs> nebula, a cloud of gas and dust, which comes together under the force of gravity. So a nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust, and it's come together because everything is attracted to everything else by gravity. Then you get a protostar, which is as they come together, then you get friction. Okay, now you get friction between those particles. That causes a high temperature and pressure. Remember me saying high temperature and pressure was needed for nuclear fusion. So now you've got fusion going on and you've got a protostar. Now when it, it reaches a kind of stable period where the radiation pressure from the fusion, the force pushing, pushing outwards from the fusion and the gravity force inwards are balanced. That is called a main sequence star. You have this balance of forces, radiation pressure outwards, gravity inwards, balance. Okay. Now, all stars have a main sequence, but it's what happens after where it starts to get different, whether it's a sun-like star or a massive star. So we're going to deal with the sun-like star first. Sun-like star, basically, uh, once the hydrogen starts to run out, the star expands and it cools down. Okay, so it gets redder because it's cooler. And um, that you've got a red giant now. And other elements are being fused all the way up to iron. So other elements are made by fusion up to iron. There is a... Um, white dwarf after that which is when the um, layers of that now large cool star just drift into space and you get left behind this like hot core where fusion is still going on the layers drift into space and they make the planetary nebula um, until all the hydrogen runs out and then it just psh, snuffs it and you get a brown dwarf not giving out any light anymore but the interesting thing is when you get a massive star so there's a star which is much more mass than our sun you get rather than a red giant you get a red super giant same thing basically happens it expands and cools and the elements up to iron are made by fusion but if it's got a critical density then it will be pulled together under its own gravity and it will collapse on this dense core and you'll get this massive explosion and loads of extra energy is around so you can do lots more fusion and that is when all uh, elements that are more massive than iron uh, than iron is made are made and that's how we know we were this you know everything on this planet there are heavier elements than iron everything on this planet was made that's heavier than iron was made in a supernova around this region of space it's amazing isn't it it's really interesting it's, it's um it's uh the, the saying that we're all made of stardust is actually true okay anyway moving on now if it's got a certain amount of mass it will be a neutron star which is a very dense ball of neutrons that should say apologies or if it's got enough mass, if it's got a massive amount of mass, <laughs> literally it was very, very, very massive, then you will have uh, a black hole left over, which is an object so dense that not even light can escape its gravity field. So it looks black. Um, a few more slides to do, and then that's us. So satellites, gravity acts as a centripetal force, which is just a force towards the center of an orbit, and it keeps satellites orbiting Earth keeps anything moving in a circle a centripetal force this causes a change in direction so therefore that's still a change in velocity so it's still an acceleration so they ask you about that so um, geostationary orbits are at the same point above the equator and have an orbital period of 24 hours they're used for communication and for broadcasting so if you can think about a planet in front of me the planet spinning this way the geostationary orbit will be quite high above the equator um, and it will take 24 hours to get all the way around so it will always be exactly the same point in the sky so we only have to point our dishes once and we can we can pick it up and it's used for broadcasting if you've got sky tv at home then that is what's going on a satellite a geostationary satellite is pointing at your house or pointing at the large region around of, of the uk and your house is picking up the signal um, a low polar orbit orbits the opposite way around over the poles of earth and it goes around the earth much more um much more many times per day it's about two hours is the orbital period the length of time it takes to get all the way around the earth and that <laughs> lols <laughs> excuse me let me just kick this guy i'll just hide him why not <laughs> um sorry let me <laughs> pause for a second 
Uh, so where are we? Low polar orbit. So they go around like every two hours. So they can basically see the entire Earth really, really often. And therefore they're great for spying or for monitoring the weather or anything like that. So um, every height above Earth has a speed at which a satellite travels such that it falls to Earth at the same rate as Earth falls away from it. So this is Newton's cannon idea and a lot of people like this idea. So if you can imagine a cannonball like flying forward in space, well, it is going to fall down to Earth. And if Earth falls away from it at the same rate, so in other words, because of the curvature of Earth, it falls away from it at the same rate, then it will do one complete lap of Earth or it will just keep lapping Earth, okay? Um, and if it's going too slow, then it won't go fast enough and it will spiral towards Earth, it will crash land on Earth. If it's going too fast, then it will spiral away from Earth. Okay, so loads of people like this as just being a really simple um, explanation of how orbits work. So radiation and temperature then, this is a bit of a tricky bit, I think. Uh, but again, keep your answers quite simple, just memorize this kind of terminology is what I suggest for this. All bodies emit EM radiation. And the higher the temperature is, the higher the intensity of the radiation, so there's many more photons released, and the higher the peak frequency of the EM radiation it emits. This means it emits bluer light. Okay, so higher frequency, bluer light, higher energy. So if it's, hot, if it's hotter, higher energy, bluer light, but also more, also higher intensity. Therefore, lower temperature, lower frequency, or longer wavelength, so redder light. Now don't confuse that with redshift, okay? This is not about the wavelength changing because something's moving, it's about actually emitting redder light. Okay, the next thing to talk about is the greenhouse effect. Now Earth's atmosphere transmits really high frequency light. So Earth's atmosphere allows in light from the sun basically, the UV light as well as loads of other light as well. All this light, the high frequency stuff is absorbed by the Earth and it's re-emitted as infrared. Infrared does not leave the atmosphere, it isn't transmitted, it's reflected by the atmosphere. So the heat is trapped in, so that's why we call it like a greenhouse, because it, it literally works exactly the same like a greenhouse. Now that's fine, that's what how the Earth's atmosphere is supposed to work, but the problem is that the rate of greenhouse um, effect is actually increased by carbon pollutants, so we lead to global warming. Um, and yes, Donald, it is, it's a reproducible finding, okay? So that is something when loads of scientists do the same, um, they investigate the same thing with different experiments and they come to the same conclusions, where loads of scientists come to that conclusion. Last slide then is seismology. So P waves are often called pressure waves and they're longitudinal. They're often called primary waves because they're faster than secondary waves. So P waves is the horizontal shake of the earth that gives you a little warning because it gets there first. The S waves are called surface waves. They're transverse and they're the ones that do the damage. And they're often called secondary waves as they're slower than the primary waves. And uh, we know that the Earth has a solid mantle, a liquid outer core, and a solid inner core. And that's because S waves don't travel through liquids, and so they leave a shadow on the far side of the Earth. And P waves are refracted on the boundary between the mantle and the outer core, and so they leave two shadows on the far side of the Earth. Now, that's a diagram. You're going to have to look that one up, that diagram. Um, but just remember this. S waves don't travel through the liquids. So you get the S wave shadow zone, which tells you you have a liquid outer core. And we know the P waves tell us that there is, um, we know that there's a solid inner core because of the refraction that goes on at the boundary between the mantle and the outer core. That's the lot, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to go back to, why not, the chat here. I'll have a quick look at the chat. I am pretty tired. If you've got any questions, then you just do just ask. Um, I really hope that was useful. Thank you, Lion Maker fan. Awesome. I'm glad that was useful. Um, does black body radiation come from OCR? Yes, that was it there. I did do that. I did um, talk through that briefly yesterday in the live stream, which I suggest you check out, which is the six marker. Okay. Um, half equations don't come up in physics as far as I'm aware. Net decline, unless you're talking about a different exam board. I'm not sure how to do that. So I'm not going to do that because I will probably confuse things if I give it a go. Mal Mal I'll just have a little go. Somebody's saying the VR is really good. Yeah. Uh, my, my 3D camera here. Have you tried Gorilla Physics in VR? You can really see every hair on my beautiful beard. Somebody asked earlier on why am I called Gorilla Physics? Why not answer that one? I don't really know to be honest, um, except the fact that I've just always been a big fan of, of gorillas. And therefore I have a lot of them. And they're all called Gary, as is my little Lego gorilla. As is my little Lego gorilla that um, 
was given to me by uh, Lord Matheson of um, <laughs> A-Level Physics Online fame. <laughs> so that's why I'm called Gorillas. This, this guy's been in my classroom for uh, ever since I started teaching. So Gary is a big deal for me um, and he's been my mascot ever since I started teaching. So, you know, he's now my channel mascot. I also look a little bit like a gorilla. And it's just some way of being different from everyone else. I used to be called Mr. Betts Physics, but uh, I decided to change my name to something a bit more random, a little bit more Primrose Kitten, let's say. Um, <laughs> so it's just a random reason, basically. Uh, what are the other risks of Half-Life? So you think about the risks and things. Um, so it's not about the it, we We choose what isotope to get depending on the Half-Life. So if we want something to be radioactive for a long time, then we pick a long Half-Life, so something we don't want to replace often. Um, if we want something to be radioactive for a really short time, like a tracer, so we don't want it to stay in somebody's body or in the environment where we've uh, used it, we would pick a short half-life that's just long enough for us to make our measurements and then it won't be radioactive for a long time. I hope that helps. Um, hello people doing juices, I want to, <laughs> I want to warn you A-level chemistry is horrible. Yes, yeah, so I do A-level physics instead. <laughs> uh, last year it was on ultrasound and x-rays. don't know uh, why that would help, but it might. Yeah, okay, so probably not going to be on ultrasound and x-ray 6 markers, but they will probably still come up at some point um, in the test, so don't don't think that you're going to get out of... Uh, don't think you're going to get out of <laughs> revising them. Uh, what's the use of Half-Life? Well, one way is radiocarbon dating, isn't it? So that, um, that often comes up. So radioactive carbon has a Half-Life of 5,700 years, you don't need to memorize that, they'll tell you if you need to use it. So it might be that they give you a sample which has a certain um, certain activity and they knew it was an activity of this at the start and therefore you can work out how many half-lives have passed and hence work out the age of a thing. Yeah, life cycle, stellar evolution and life cycle are the same thing. Yeah, may, might well be a six marker on life cycle of a star. What do you do if the ray goes through the principal focus before it hits the lens? Well, you can draw those as well. You can draw those as well. I just don't bother because you only need to do two rays to get all the marks. So you can do, um, I would just stick to my one, two, and three, to be honest. Okay, you can do a ray that goes through the principal focus, then gets refracted parallel to the axis, but I would just stick to the ones that I, I told you. Why use a fluorescent coating in a bulb and UV rays instead of just emitting visible light straight from the mains. It's, I think it's just about having a um, more continuous spectrum, really, the fluorescent um, the fluorescent coating bulbs. So the problem with old fluorescent tubes is they only gave out about sort of six different wavelengths of light, and that was mixed together to give um, that was mixed together to give white light. But it wasn't a very like good spectrum of white light. But nowadays we are, we use more like LED stuff. That's quite cool, isn't it? With a, it is mark there, um, and they give out a more continuous spectrum. So I don't want to worry you too much about spectrums, but um, that's why. So basically, the the electrons emit UV, and then they cause another material to fluoresce, and that gives you a more continuous spectrum rather than discrete lines, and it being a funny color mix, like it. Um, uh, it used to take photos and they would look really green in fluorescent lights, so they're not as bad as... Will there be an AAA version? I think you mean AQA, yeah, you do. <laughs> I did the AQA one earlier on, so check that out, that'll be recorded on there. Um, I did stopping and thinking distance, hope that was useful. Um, Alright everyone, uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for being patient at the start everybody, like the emoji emojis from Gammy. Okay, um, where are we? Up? Any more questions just now? Can you explain redshift? I thought I just did, but um, just say, think about it like this. Something is emitting waves, and if it's going away from you, then it's getting further away from every single wave it emits. So the wavelength appears longer. Okay, so just remember that. Wavelength means the apparent wavelength is longer to the observer if it's moving away from the observer. Um, good, I'm glad, Amy. Really glad to help. When will this video be up? It'll be up straight after this, my dude. What practicals are required for this paper? I think I've gone through them all in this little um, thing, so just go through that. I just said, I stopped and said practicals, and I said exactly what to measure, exactly what to measure it with. That would be good enough for a... Um, 
and answer or just describe a method. Can you please go through the other half question? Talked about that. What to do? How to answer a question? Um, pause, relax, and think to yourself. Well, what part of the syllabus do I know that can help me solve this? So, um, if you're not sure, you know, it, it probably is a context that's given you a bit of a kind of um, thrown you a little bit. Pause. Think to yourself. All oh, right, this is waves. What part of waves is it? Okay, this is redshift. Or, you know, something. Or so I'm just going to put down my explanation of redshift. Cool light, so it is cool, isn't it? My dad gave it to me. Um, yeah, this is how I look so beautiful on the video. Look, I've got all the lights. This is also here to help me with my uh, visualizer that I use just to make sure it's illuminated, just in case I needed to draw any quick diagrams or anything today. Are there any speeds and accelerations we have to memorize? Yeah, you just need to be able to do some estimations. So I went through that on that slide, basically a thousand kilograms roughly for a car. Just basically you need to be able to re recognize if something's like way off. Okay, so cars don't travel at 300 meters per second, for example. Okay, the, um, tra cars travel at somewhere in the region of 50 meters per second. That would be like 100 miles an hour, in fact, so probably not even that quick. So just you just need to have some kind of general idea of what normal everyday speeds are. We walk at about a meter per second, which is about like, Two by is 2.2 miles per hour, so that's a kind of sauntering pace. So you really need to be able to say that. Thanks, Lauren. Glad it helped. Thanks, um, Afra. Glad it helped. I don't have some sort of educational guess of what I'll be in. If S waves are transverse, why do they not travel in in liquid? Um, S waves. Don't think of them as just being transverse. They're going to be in surface waves, and there isn't a surface between the core, the um, the outer core, and the mantle. There's no set like. Imagine if you were like. Um, if you had the sea, those are surface waves on the surface of the sea. Uh, they're not quite as simple as transverse waves, but they are transverse for your GCSE. Um, if you imagine if you had something right against the surface of the sea, would you have any surface waves? Okay, I hope that makes sense. But it, it, but we just say for simplicity's sake, S waves don't travel in the liquids because you, that, there's no surface. So just remember that S waves don't travel in the liquids, therefore you get the S wave shadow zone. Therefore we know there must be a liquid outer core. And we can say how big it is, because we can see the size of the shadow zone. Tell us the story about the Tunisian cows. I was waiting, I wasn't gonna tell you the story about the Tunisian cows unless somebody asked, right? Here we go. So when I was first a teacher, um, a young lady um, got a bit upset for the biology test that I set. And she said, <laughs> she was doing it, she was literally doing the test. The whole classroom was quiet. And she went, what, Tunisian cows? <laughs> We haven't learned about Tunisian cows. <laughs> so she said she was just absolutely upset because there was this question about Tunisian cows. And the question was really about like um, genetic, like, uh, you know, not natural selection. What's the opposite of natural selection? It was about selective breeding. Like, you know, cows have been selectively bred to be better at living in Tunisia and give you more milk and more um, more beef, right? So I just want you to think about that. If it, you know, if you think to yourself, um, what on earth is this question about? What on earth is this question about? Well, it's not about Tunisian cows. It's about uh, an actual topic you have learned about. You just have to apply it to that. And it's, it was always stuck with me, that, that one. Like, uh, I always like to tell it to somebody. Whenever they're asking, you know, it's that thing, isn't it? Like GCSE memes, like, thank you, OCR. You put something completely random on our paper that we haven't learned about. Well, actually, that question was about something that you have learned about. It's just a context for that question. And they do that to make it harder. They do that to distinguish between the kind of grades six, sevens, and eights. So, you know, don't panic about it. Just be one of the ones that can spot the content within the context. It was actually a feed I did a little while ago, which is Dr. Lemon's um, trick to paper free. There isn't a paper free GCSE, but um, yeah, there was a selection to that. Yes, I can do a link to the slideshow, Lewis, um, and I will do that in the comments just afterwards. All right. Um, thanks so much for your time and dedication. It's so unusual to find people willing to get the time and effort for free. Um, you're awesome and so passionate about physics. It's contagious. I'm really glad, Nia. I hope that maybe I've given some of you a uh, pause of thought whether you want to do A-level physics next year. If you're interested in A-level physics next year, then do make sure that you subscribe. And even if you're not, then the best way to help me out and just to say thank you is to give me a little share out. Um, yeah, it is a funny and funny story, isn't it? So don't giggle about it when you're in the thing. Um, 
don't giggle about it when you're in the paper tomorrow but it's a way to think about that whole idea isn't it so do share this out with your friends please if you know your friends are watch are, are preparing for ocr gateway as well giving it a little share give it a little like as well please everybody um because the more likes and shares and things and comments in the real comments that these videos get the more youtube puts them out to next people um I think, Olivia, I have explained refraction just earlier on. So if you go back to that, it's basically because light slows down when it meets a boundary or it speeds up when it meets a boundary. And one side of the wave slows down or speeds up first. So the wave turns. Um, I'm doing it at LXL. Yes, it does still apply. I think probably at LXL between the two live feeds I've done today, the AQA1 and that, I'll have covered everything. Sorry, I haven't had time to do absolutely everything. Um, but I hope it was helpful in any case, Lauren. Cheers, Matty. Cheers, Lion Maker fan. <laughs> what on earth the name is that? Lion Maker fan. <laughs> you made any lions? Have you, have you selectively bred some lions? Some questions here is conundrum, guys. I'm not sure what that means, my dude. Physics lessons were basically just running around the classroom when your teacher is learning the difference between AC and DC. Okay, well... <laughs> I'm not even going to comment on that, I'm afraid. All right. Yeah, I, I'm going to do lots more OCI A-level videos next year as well because I'm, I'm teaching that syllabus next time as well. Don't forget, there's some um, videos in the description for you to check out as well. Leave a comment, as I said, in the real thing. Like it, share it, all that, everything. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, Matt Abzi. Glad to help. Haven't selected some lions, long. All right. Do you know you can cross a lion and a tiger and you get a liger? Have you ever heard of that? It's literally, a, it's a thing. Um but it's biology, so let's leave it there. All right, bye everyone. Have a lovely, well, have a lovely day tomorrow. Well, tomorrow, think about it, tomorrow you will have finished your GCSEs, exactly, and I'm so pleased for you. I'm actually going to be really jealous of you when I see year 11 walk out of my school just, like, properly partying for weeks. I'm going to be completely jealous, okay? So have a great summer. You really enjoyed it, and if you've worked hard for it, if you work hard one last time, then you don't need to worry about those grades because they'll be perfectly fine. I hope you hope you do really well. Yes, Doppler effect should be on the paper um, in one shape or the other. Okay, bye-bye, dudes.